In this episode of The Rewind, I discuss my experience with the Mac Mini after using it as my daily driver for the last few months. Spoiler, it's awesome. But first, a word from our sponsor. 9to5Mac is sponsored by AirBuddy 2, a must-have utility for AirPods users. The original version was great, but AirBuddy 2 comes with tons of new incredible features. It extends macOS to improve your AirPods experience, and it's fully compatible with Big Sur and Apple Silicon. Just open your charging case next to your Mac to see a beautiful UI with info on batteries, connection, and status. With AirBuddy 2, you can connect and change listening modes at the same time with a single trackpad gesture. Automate system volume audio input and listening mode so you're ready to go into a video call with just a single click. And you can enjoy custom global keyboard shortcuts that allow you to quickly connect to, disconnect from, or change listening modes on your devices. Go to airbuddy.app slash 9to5mac to learn more. The first 100 9to5mac viewers to use that URL will get Airbuddy with a 20% discount. And stay tuned to the end of this video to learn about even more things that Airbuddy 2 can do for you. Welcome to The Rewind. My experience with the M1 Mac Mini. The M1 Mac Mini starts at $699 for the entry-level model with 8-core CPU, 8-core GPU, and 256 gigabytes of storage. More importantly, this Mac Mini comes with just 8 gigabytes of unified memory, which cannot be upgraded after the fact like Intel-based models can. Apple still sells that Intel Mac Mini, which starts at $1099, but despite its ability to accommodate money-saving RAM upgrades, along with more I.O. options like two additional Thunderbolt 3 ports and 10 gigabytes, a bit ethernet, it's hard for me to recommend Intel-based Macs given the leap in performance made possible by Apple Silicon. But this isn't a head-to-head -head comparison of Intel versus Apple. It's a long-term look at my day-to-day -day experience with Apple's most compact desktop computer. And I'll just say this, my outlook is largely favorable, but the Mac Mini isn't perfect and it's not a foregone conclusion that you should upgrade to this Mac Mini if you own a previous version or if you're in a market for a new desktop. And there are some reasons for that. But I will say that ultimately, yes, you are going to want to go to Apple Silicon because in a lot of respects, the performance benefits are downright amazing. The most important thing to consider about the Mac Mini, or really any M1 Mac for that matter, is how you plan on using it. If you just plan on using it to browse the web, you know, do spreadsheets, word processing, things of that nature, really, really low key things, the base model is more or less up to the task. But if you plan on doing anything else, anything that's even remotely heavy in nature, then I absolutely recommend that you opt for the 16 gigabyte upgrade. First and foremost, just like Apple's laptops, RAM configuration are final. If you choose an 8GB Mac Mini, you're stuck with an 8GB Mac Mini and you can never upgrade. Considering that the upgrade is just $200 to 16GB of RAM, I definitely recommend that you upgrade in almost all circumstances. Otherwise, be prepared to encounter slow and choppy performance when you run out of RAM due to the fact that you'll be swapping out to disk, which is inherently slower. And if you have a limited amount of disk space, you can even start getting out of memory errors when trying to swap out to disk. Yeah, that can be super annoying. The moral of the story, get 16 gigabytes. I'm going to say it again, get 16 gigabytes. You will not regret it. Storage is a much more flexible uh, subject matter because more storage can just be bolted on using USB and Thunderbolt SSDs. And the Mac Mini in this regard is better equipped than its laptop brethren because it also includes two USB-A ports for connecting external peripherals like SSDs. That means that you're able to retain those precious Thunderbolt 3 ports for other uses. Thanks to an external SSDs, it's relatively easy to get by with the base 256 gigabyte storage amount in the Mac Mini. But I recommend opting for at least the next tier, which is 512 gigabytes, because that gives you a little bit more wiggle room to work with. Now, along with the RAM upgrade, that brings the price of the Mac Mini to $1099, or the same amount that Apple charges for the base Intel Mac Mini currently. In my opinion, an M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD is the sweet spot, and it's the configuration I recommend for most users. Now, to supplement the Mac Mini's internal storage, I primarily use an OWC Helios 3S enclosure paired with my 24 terabyte Amphotech Squid PCIe SSD setup. You can learn more about that setup in another video I did last year. Now for portable storage, I love using the Samsung T7, which continues to be one of the best mobile SSDs on the market. I love using that between my Mac Mini and my MacBook Pro and even my iPad. 
And speaking of I.O., here's how the Mac Mini compares to the M1 MacBook Air and MacBook Pro. Now, the MacBook Air slash Pro includes the two Thunderbolt ports and a 3.5 millimeter headphone input. That's all you get with the laptop. The Mac Mini, on the other hand, includes the two Thunderbolt ports, a 3.5 millimeter headphone input, and you also get HDMI 2.0, you get two USB-A ports, and you get gigabit ethernet, although there is no 10 gigabit ethernet option, which is unfortunate. So comparatively, the Mac Mini is a much more capable machine in terms of I.O. Now granted, you can connect dongles to your MacBook, but the Mac Mini provides a cleaner solution out of the box. As mentioned though, it still lacks the type of I.O. options, those two extra Thunderbolt ports and the 10 gigabit ethernet option that are found on Intel-based Mac mini machines. The biggest difference between the Mac Mini and the MacBook Air slash MacBook Pro is the form factor. With the Mac Mini, you obviously have to provide an external display for it to connect to. The good news is that you can connect your Mac Mini to a variety of displays, from the 1080p run-of-the-mill HDMI monitor to a television, on up to something like Apple's Pro Display XDR, that Thunderbolt-enabled 6K display. And as a Pro Display XDR user, I've been really happy with the performance of all M1 Macs when paired with this display. It makes for a great great Mac mini companion because the M1 GPU can drive the display at full resolution. That's 60, 16 by 3384 at 60 frames per second. But the fact that you have to provide an external display can also be seen as a negative as well. It should come as no surprise, but unless you already own a standalone display, you'll need to factor in the cost of a display into the purchase of your Mac mini. Now let's talk about Bluetooth problems because wow, this is still going on and it's 2021. And since the Mac mini doesn't come with a mouse or a keyboard, you're gonna to need to provide your own. I rotate between a Magic Mouse slash Magic Trackpad and the Magic Keyboard slash Keychron K2. Now, unfortunately, all these devices experience intermittent connectivity from time to time due to the ongoing issues with Bluetooth. My biggest beef with the Mac mini and to a lesser extent, my M1 MacBook and MacBook Air are its Bluetooth connectivity issues. Apple has simply never been very good with Bluetooth, or perhaps Bluetooth in and of itself is just the wrong type of wireless technology to use for such important peripherals like a keyboard and a mouse. The issues with Bluetooth are glaring on the Mac mini or any desktop Mac computer, because unlike a laptop, there is no integrated keyboard or trackpad. I've even had major Bluetooth issues with my Mac Pro, so it's not solely an issue with the Mac mini or Apple Silica. The issue usually revolves around, you know, intermittent disconnects, and although it doesn't always occur it seems to happen at the most inopportune times. I've tried all the so-called remedies, disconnecting any USB 3 devices, eliminating Wi-Fi, etc and still no dice. Now I will say that Apple's Mac OS 11.2 update which had Bluetooth fixes in tow seems to have helped out a lot as a lot of the Bluetooth issues on my M1 Macs are nowhere near as bad when compared to the previous version of Mac OS but they haven't entirely disappeared. Now let's talk about speakers because the Mac mini speaker is laughably horrible, but that should come as no surprise since it's always been that way. But Apple basically includes a speaker in the Mac mini that's good enough for one thing and one thing only, and that's simply to be audible, <laughs> nothing more. With that in mind, you're gonna need to either rely on a pair of headphones or connect a pair of external speakers or monitors. Unfortunately, the Pro Display XDR doesn't have any speakers and I've yet to settle on a pair that's small enough to fit within my compact workspace. I might end up getting another pair of iLoud micro monitors, which are surprisingly powerful to be so small. Alternatively, I guess I could use a HomePod mini stereo pair, but that would only be good for music playback due to inherent latency issues performance. Now, the main reason I use Macs is to have access to Final Cut Pro. The Mac Mini, like all M1-enabled Macs, is surprisingly good at editing videos thanks to its powerful GPU and CPU. What's even more impressive, though, is how well these machines handle HEVC, H.265, and 10-bit HDR workflows. If you haven't noticed, we have largely transitioned over to HDR videos on 9to5Mac's YouTube channel, and much of this is owed to the M1 system on a chip because it just makes it so easy to work with 10-bit video on the timeline and when exporting. Now the Mac Mini when paired with an HDR capable display like the Pro Display XDR is a great companion for HDR workflows and it has made working with this type of video so much easier than before even when I had more costlier machines in Apple's Mac lineup. You may say this is just for your particular workflow Jeff but I, I think you're going to find these sentiments echoed across many different types of disciplines. Obviously the Mac Mini isn't great for certain types of work and there's an outright 
lack of boot camp support, which makes it difficult for users to rely on Windows. If you're a gamer, for instance, you're probably not gonna wanna go with the Mac mini unless you're just like really super into Apple Arcade. And also there's no external GPU support for M1 Macs. Now that's obviously a bad thing because if you already own an eGPU, you can't use it at all with this new Mac. But it's a good thing in the sense that you actually don't really need an external GPU with this Mac mini like you need it with the Intel Mac mini, which absolutely required an external GPU to do anything graphics wise. It really shows how impressive Apple's iGPU is on the M1 Mac. With all that being said, the Mac mini is still a first generation product and there are occasional bugs and crashes and just the overall weird stuff that I haven't seen on my Intel machines before. But by and large, the M1 Mac mini like the M1 MacBooks are downright outstanding machines and provide an incredible amount of power for not that much money. And another thing I wanted to mention is that the Mac mini is pretty much dead quiet for everything I do with it, including rendering and exporting large complex 4K HDR videos via Final Cut Pro. Is the Mac mini worth it? Well, as long as you opt for the 16 gigabyte version during the build to order process, the answer is yes. But you also need to consider the fact that this is a first generation or first iteration of the Mac mini with Apple Silicon and forthcoming versions will likely feature more powerful chips, more robust configuration options and more IO. But even in its current form, the Mac mini is the most versatile of any of the machines in Apple's M1 lineup. And it also happens to be the least expensive. When paired with the right peripherals, the the Mac Mini Shines is one of the best Macs that we've seen in quite some time. What do you guys think? Let me know down below in the comment section. Thumbs up if you appreciate this video, thumbs down if you didn't, and be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac. 9to5Mac is sponsored by AirBuddy 2, a must-have utility for AirPods users. As we discuss, AirBuddy 2 is the perfect companion for AirPods. It also extends macOS with the batteries widget and menu bar icon that shows all your devices intelligent intelligently grouped, and smart stats give you battery usage over time, total listening time, call time, and shows you which AirPod is draining its battery more quickly. But AirBuddy goes beyond headphones. It can show battery information for your iOS devices, accessories like the Magic Keyboard and Magic Mouse, and even other Macs running AirBuddy, including their accessories. And with the Magic Handoff, you can transfer a Magic Mouse trackpad or keyboard between two Macs running AirBuddy with just a few clicks. Go to airbuddy.app slash 9to5Mac to learn more. The first 100 9to5Mac viewers to use that URL will get AirBuddy with a 20% discount. Special thanks to AirBuddy 2 for sponsoring 9 to 5 Mac.